Well, you know, Gorilla's contributions to the wrestling business, probably being an announcer, was one of the minor ones because um, obviously he was he was a hotshot amateur at I believe he in Ithaca, New York, whatever the college, possibly. Uh, before uh, you go on, I want I want to stop you. Could this be another example of how you know how people only know Jerry Lawler? Some kids, some younger yes. people, only know him as the announcer guy, and they have no idea that he was an, an you know, this huge legend in Memphis, or don't care one of the two, and I'm wondering if the same is true with Gorilla. Well, you know, it may be to the point, because they always portrayed Gorilla, you know, until the time he was done with them, uh, you know, and off-camera as a former wrestling legend, but they didn't, they reminded people, I guess, every once in a while, but now that's been 15 years or whatever, so maybe they've forgotten, but he was one of the biggest stars in the business, literally and figuratively. He was, uh, you know, at the time when athletes weren't that big, he was six foot six, and he was 300 and some pounds, and he had wrestled at a big size in, in college and was pretty dominant as an amateur. Uh, Gino Morella, Bob Morella. And, uh, oh, dear God. Is that where Santino Morella got his name? Oh, if, uh, of course. You need an Italian name. You go with a, a Gorilla. But he ended up, he lucked into, he got, uh, in, in the pro ranks, he got Wild Red Berry as a manager early. And he was this Manchurian giant with the big beard named Gorilla Monsoon that didn't speak English, right? Mm -hmm. And he was a challenger to Bruno Sammartino. And they went like an hour and a half in the garden. <clears throat> and he headlined all the major Northeastern shows for Vince Sr. And got to be such a big star. At the same time, he was a very highly educated guy and... and and uh, got involved in the office and started in promotion and bought into capital sports. And by the, I guess he was an agent for the matches or he was a, a, a guy that would go to the buildings and check up first and then finally got involved as an owner and actually owned a smaller percentage of the WWWF in the 70s under Vince Sr. And didn't end up selling until Vince Jr. bought his father and all his partners out in 1983, 82 or 83. <clears throat> so, I mean, he made a fortune. That, and that was the thing about Gorilla in, in his later days. As the commissioner, he always had the nice watch. I mean, the Rolex and the, some jewelry and a nice suit on. And he carried like $10,000 in cash on him at all times, just for walking around money. <laughs> and he's a Gorilla, why, well, I, I might want to buy something. And and who's going to take perfectly logical reason? Right? Of course. Yeah, he he could walk down the street and not really be concerned that he was going to get mugged. So uh, I thought he, you know, everybody loved him. He was a great guy to work with, and uh, you know, he also did the uh, the deal with Muhammad Ali when Vince Senior was promoting uh, uh, the Ali and Noki fight and the Shea Stadium match with uh, Andre and Wepner that that headlined the closed circuit all over the country. Um, and they needed to do an angle to kind of get some publicity. Gorilla was the one that they picked to more or less come out of retirement and have a uh, match in uh, at their TV taping where Ali would get involved and Gorilla would give him an airplane spin and dump him over the top rope and not kill him. He was the one they trusted, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he was he was one of Vince McMahon seniors and juniors inner circle for quite a while.